So let's go ahead and just jump into the general discussion before we jump over to the slides. And the first thing I want to do is just do a really quick recap on some of the things that we talked about last month, starting with why is content marketing so important? And if you attended last month, you heard us talk about the fact that, you know, a, a recent study that was done showed that 85% of B2B buyers, by the time they actually go into market, like they're starting to research um, vendors to solve a problem for them or a new solution that they need to implement in their business, 85% of the time when they go into that process, they already have a short list of four to five vendors that they're thinking about. So that's before they even start researching. So when you think about going after now buyers, that should make you shake in your boots just a little bit because they've already got four to five vendors in mind before they actually go into market. The same study showed that 90% of the time they're actually going to buy from one of those four to five vendors that they already had on their short list. And so the whole reason why content marketing is so critical today is that buyer behavior has changed and we've got to make it on that short list. And the way that we make it on that short list is we leverage content and education to really capture and hold the attention of the buyer so that when they do move from what we call a future buyer somebody that's potentially an ideal prospect for us to a now buyer, they're actually looking for help that we're kind of filed away in their brain as somebody that can help them. And so that's one of the number one reasons why uh, content marketing is so important. Now, the goal of content marketing, we talked about this last time as well. Uh, most people think that the goal of content marketing is to grow awareness and to drive traffic and to generate leads for their business. And one of the things we said last month was, yes, those are desired outcomes. Yes, that's 100% what we're trying to do for our business, but and that's the benefit to our business, but that can't be the goal of content marketing. The goal of content marketing has to be to become the go-to resource for our target audience. Because when we focus on them, we're gonna create a lot better content than when we focus on ourselves. And what we see at Vindy Digital is that most businesses attack content marketing from a selfish perspective. Like, what can I do to generate more awareness? What can I do to generate more traffic? And when you start there, you're missing out. We have to start with, actually, how do we serve our customer the best? How do we become ultimately that go-to resource? Um, and then the last thing that we just talked about on why this is so important is that buyer preferences buyer change. So it, when we think about just the way that buyers consume content and information, not too long ago, getting them to come to our website or our blog um, to get that information was acceptable to them. But in today's world, not so much. They want you to be where they go to learn and they want the information in consumable sound bites and they want access to longer content when they want it. So it's really much a customer on demand situation. And so because those preferences have changed, we've got to think differently about the type of content that we produce and where we distribute that content. So that's why this is so important. Moving on to the next agenda item right there is just a readiness checklist. So one thing that we, uh, you know, Ray and I were getting ready for this meeting and we're like adding this at the last moment, because one thing that we see happening a lot is people like marketing departments want to get involved uh, in content marketing because they see the value and the importance of it, but they're missing a few ingredients that are going to set them up for the opposite of success, right? So if you want to be set up for success, make sure that you've got these things that I'm going to walk you through. Number one, that you've already figured out what your narrative and point of view is. Like your company exists in the market to do something beneficial for your customers or you wouldn't be in business. And so do you have a clear understanding of your narrative, your point of view about what's broken in your client's world and how you see the best way for them to accomplish and overcome what's broken in their business? That's what I mean by narrative and positioning and point of view. Number two, you've got to really understand how can you tie the content that you're going to create ultimately to your superpower? Because one thing that we see is people struggle with when it comes to generating good content is they can write about a lot of topics, but they forget to connect the dots between this topic that they're writing and their superpower or their unique selling proposition. And ultimately that's gotta be woven into every piece of content that we produce. And I'm not talking about a strong call to action per se in every single topic that we produce or every single piece of content we produce, but I am talking about making sure that 
everything that we write about kind of subtly points to something that we're uniquely qualified to help them with. And so we need to figure that out. What is our unique selling proposition as it relates to the content that we want to produce? Um, next down there, as we're talking about this readiness checklist, is uh, really making sure that leadership understands the power of content. You know, I can't tell you how many times, and Ray can attest to this as well, you know, we're helping a client figure out their content strategy, and we come up with this um, recipe, if you will, of content that they need to produce, and the, the owners or leadership of the business um, don't give it enough time to really become successful because they're looking for immediate return on investment and content marketing isn't one of those things that's going to provide immediate return on investment. And if they haven't bought in, then they're going to give you a lot of frustration down the road. So make sure that your leadership is really bought into this process as well. Um, the next thing down my list here, as I'm looking over here, we're talking about this readiness checklist is really understanding our customer. You know, who is that subset that we can serve absolutely the best, our ideal customer profile, because we want to make sure when we write our content that we're calling that audience out and we they feel like the content that we produce is speaking right to their situation. And then the last piece of the checklist, if you will, um, is do you have the resources or bandwidth to actually create the content? And, you know, we introduced a concept of a content flywheel last month. That's a way that you can actually, you know, create long form content and break it into smaller pieces. We'll talk a little bit about that today, but really making sure that you have the resources that you need uh, to really uh, go through this endeavor, I think is really important. So just to recap on the checklist, make sure you've got a good narrative and point of view. Uh, make sure you can understand your unique selling proposition and how to connect the dots. Make sure leadership is on board with what you're trying to do. Make sure you really understand your customer, your ICP, and then make sure you've got the bandwidth and the resources to actually create the content. Um, and so that's kind of before you even attack the things we're going to be covering today and digging into topics, make sure you've got that stuff figured out first. We're not going to talk about those things today. Those are things you got to kind of have figured out in advance. And so the next topic down on our agenda is really... Um, we feel like, man, businesses just struggle with coming up with good topics for their companies. We see it all the time. And so, Ray, what do you feel are the challenges that B2B companies have when it comes to coming up with really good topics that their audience is going to care about? Well, out on the market, um, there's a lot of companies that uh, and, and we use the term blanket advice. They'll tell you, you know, how to come up with content topics. And it's blanket advice. It's a one size fits all. It doesn't go up very much in depth. And it, it, Paul and I and Vendi Digital, you know, we want to show you and purpose of the seminar is how to do it. We're going to go very, very much in depth. So, you know, first, I would say, you know, blanket advice that's out there on the market, one size fits all. And you get to the blog or the how to or the greatest guide. And it's three paragraphs long and it's written for SEO only. And right. uh, it doesn't address the issues. The second is that people are trying to talk to everyone. And in turn, they're really talking to no one and excluding their ICP. You know, you can do your audience profiles, build your audiences in LinkedIn and interviewing your clients and figure out who the decision makers are, who the influencers are within the companies you're targeting. And that's who you need to write to. And speaking of that, you know, another problem is the me versus you. Uh, there's this old adage, um, old like me, which is nobody gives a darn about your company or you. What they care about, and that person we just talked about, is how are you going to solve my problems? Why should I care about your business without context? So you need to understand what you know. What you need to talk about them, not me. There's a place mm -hmm. for that. It's called a decision post, and that's a very tiny part of your content strategy. Um, and then there's also... Um, it's old school, but a really heavy emphasis on key phrases rather than problems, questions, problems um, that your clients have. So you really you're thinking more about phrases and questions rather than you are about key phrases. You can fit the key phrases in after you determine what the problems are. But um, you need to understand what your customer's problems are and then where do the keywords fit in there? Um, and, you know, an easy solution for that is the sales marketing thing is to bridge that gap and speak to your sales team. Ask them what kind of problems our customers are having. And then you can use um, you talk about 
The last thing, which is there's not enough focus on expertise, experience, authority, and trust. And I would add a, a third E to that, which is empathy. And empathy goes mm -hmm. back to the first point, which is you need to understand your customers' problems. That's the key. And then you can move from that. You can create incredible content that resonates with your customers from there. So that's the stuff I hear about all the time. Um, and it's it's not insurmountable. It just takes yeah. a little work, but knowing your customer is the key. Yeah, boy, Ray, you know, as I was listening to you talk about that, um, you know, I feel like that can be summarized in when we think about challenges with creating remarkable content. It's, um, you know, the, the desire to create commodity content, right? It's like, yeah. oh my yeah. gosh, I just, I need, I need to write words. I need to create content marketing. I need to check this box. And so I'm going to go grab the key, for, call it the key phrase alphabet. Let me pull up my key phrase list and start finding some topics and start writing. And, you know, uh, that just really doesn't work. You know, I think you nailed yeah. it when we think about our customer and really who they are and how do we solve their problems. It ties, you know, right back to some of the things that I talked about earlier today that we've got to become the go-to resource for our audience. And when we try to create content that's all about traffic, then we end up doing those things, those challenges that you just walked through. So a great summary there, Ray. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna actually move into the presentation uh, that we've put together. Um, there is a link to these slides uh, in the agenda. You can either follow along by just clicking that link or just look along with me. We wanted you guys to have a copy of the slide. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, and then we'll go through these uh, today. There's a lot of information here that obviously we wanna share. And so really today we're going to be picking up where we uh, dropped off last month. If you are not for in the February demand gen jam session, um, you can go and there's actually a link to the replay in your agenda. You can also watch it on our website, um, but I'm going to hit a, a, Q, a, Q, a few uh, broad strokes before we get into the meat of the discussion. One is this is our demand gen framework. Uh, it's something that we've been developing over the last 23 years. And the reason I've got this up as the first slide, it's always just a good starting point and helping us understand, you know, really content, the words that we write influence every part of how we generate demand. How do we get in front of the right buyer? How do we tell them the right story? How do we create authority and empathy? And how do we basically stay top of mind with them? It all ultimately comes down to words. And when our focus is writing words that are going to really matter to our buyer and help them see us as a go-to resource, which ultimately helps them, going back to one of the very first things I said, get us onto their short list. We're in their mind when they're ready to go and market. It's really ultimately about the words and the topics and the things that we write. Um, and that is the fuel that makes demand generation go. And so last month we introduced you to this concept about what's changed. So over here on the left side of this slide, you can see kind of the old school B2B marketing way of attacking content marketing. And it was very blog centric, if you will. So you would do that key phrase alphabet that Ray and I were just talking about, come up with some topics that have a lot of search volume, write some blogs about it, throw it on your website. Hope that Google would come and crawl it and you'd get a good ranking for a couple of the key phrases you were targeting. And then down there at the bottom, you know, your target audience is out there. A couple of them might stumble across uh, your blog by doing a search on Google and then end up on your website. So the key point is, you know, the blog, it was very blog centric. The blog lived on our website and a few of our target audience would actually see it. The new school way is what we're representing on the right side, and that is we need a lot more content today than we did in the past. It needs to live in different formats, and we're going to talk through that today. What is foundational content, periodical content, and resources? We'll go more in depth in that today. Then we atomize that content, so we break it up into different formats, and we make sure that we're publishing that content in all the places that our buyers go to learn things. So we're no longer thinking about buyers coming to our website. Our website is no longer the place where all of our good stuff needs to live, but our good stuff needs to get atomized and repurposed and placed out there in all the places where our buyers go to learn. And look at the impact. When you see at the bottom of that right side, all of our customers are now going to get exposed to all of our great content because instead of us waiting for them to come to us, we're going to them in channel appropriate useful, helpful information. It's really important that you understand that because this is the future of content marketing for B2B. 
Okay, we introduced you to this concept last week as well. This is just our content marketing, or last month rather, our content marketing process that starts with planning on the far left. So we have to have a good content plan. And last month and this month are all about developing a good plan for your business. Then you have to move into the development phase, which is actually writing the content, uh, producing the information in all the right formats. Uh, the next step is distributing the content. Another huge miss, right? We really didn't talk about this in the uh, intro, but man, I see so many companies focused on developing content, but then they don't focus on distributing it and getting it out Adam, there. One yeah, of the Adam worst is, yeah, go ahead, Ray. No, I was going to say they forget about the atomized part and then the distri distribution part. Yeah, one hundred percent. It drives me crazy. Somebody might write an amazing blog a year ago or two years ago. They wrote it one time, they stick it on their website, they optimized it, and then they forget about it. When that content could be doing so much more work for their business if they just atomized it and distributed it. And we'll talk about that today. And then the last uh, circle there is measure. So if we're going to execute content marketing the right way, we have to be able to measure against um, indicators that are showing us that we're uh, connecting and engaging with our audience and that they care about our content. And then that becomes a loop, right? It just continues to circle around as we optimize and improve uh, what we're doing from a content marketing perspective. Last month, we covered one and two of planning. And so you can see we talked about audiences and how do we define audiences and uh, what is a messaging playbook and why is that important? We talked about different ways of going about and doing research to get ready for what we're going to be covering today, which is identifying content pillars that matter for our business. Uh, what is a hub and spoke strategy and how do we identify what pieces of content should be inside of a hub and spoke? Um, we're going to talk about the different content formats and how do we decide on what kind of formats we need and what types of formats. And then, and then ultimately topics. What do we write about that's going to actually get the attention um, of our buyers? So we'll cover that today. And then we'll also talk about the audit because once we, you know, kind of know who our audience is, we've done the research and we understand what matters to them. And now we've figured out the types of formats that are important and, and how we're going to get it out there and how we're going to organize our site, uh, et cetera. Now we need to kind of go back and look into um, our, what we've already produced. And I cannot tell you how incredibly valuable doing an audit is. And if you haven't audited your content in a while, man, I'm telling you with some of the things that are going on in the world, plus you take the Google helpful content update of fall of last year and the way that Google is now thinking about websites and content, you owe it to yourself to really audit your content and make sure that it's, that it's refreshed and all the things we'll get to this a little bit later on, but this is your opportunity to kind of look back at your body of work that you've already created and make sure that it's set up for success or that you're set up for success with that. Oftentimes, it's just refreshing some of the content that you already have that's going to help you a lot. And then the last step of our planning phase is how are you going to measure success? You know, ultimately, we need to know, are we heading in the right direction? Is our content really hitting with our audience? And so really what we're going to focus primarily on today are three and four, and we're going to do a deep dive on those things. And I'll stop down a couple of times uh, for you guys to ask questions for sure. So I wanted to introduce you to this concept of it's not just content marketing, uh, but it's actually remarkable content. Um, if we really want to become the go-to resource for our customers, we have to create remarkable content because what we're fighting for is that little file cabinet in their brain about what it is that you do. We call that context. So when the buyer has a problem that you can solve for them, you want to be one of those four to five vendors that they think about. And the way that we do that is by creating remarkable content. And the reason I've got this picture on this slide is, uh, I don't know if anybody knows what that is. That's actually a building I can't remember where it is, but it's Longer Burger Baskets headquarters. Uh, they're a basket company, obviously. But the point I'm trying to make is, imagine if you were driving down the highway one day and you'd never driven that way before and you drove by this building and then went on into work or went home or whatever. My guess is if you'd never seen that building before, um, one of the first things you would say to your wife or your spouse or your coworker, depending on where you're going, is, man, I just drove by this crazy building. It looked just like a basket. It was unbelievable. That's what I mean by remarkable. I think we would all agree this is a remarkable building worthy of a remark. When we think about that term, right? Remarkable, worthy of a remark. 
when we want to, when we go and create content for our business, I want you to think back to longer burger baskets here and think about how can we create content that's going to be worthy of a remark in this social media world, you know, a key part of what we're trying to do, folks call it dark social, dark funnel, whatever, is getting people to talk about our stuff. And so we want to create remarkable content. So they do. Okay, one of the things we need to do in, in order to build out a strategy and create remarkable content is begin to identify what are our content pillars. And we talked about this a little bit last time, but we recommend that you have three to five content pillars that you're going to write about. And this is really important because without having content pillars, the temptation is going to be to write about too many different topics. But at the end of the day, marketing is an exercise in memorization, and we need to make sure that folks remember us, right? That short list, we've talked about that a few times. And so what are the three to five things that you want to be known for? This is a great exercise to get your marketing team in the room, your leadership team in the room, maybe some key sales reps and subject matter experts in the room and just brainstorm on that question. You know, what is it that you want to be known for? You know, and that's what we did at Vindy Digital. And you can see we've got five, um, five categories, if you will, or content pillars over there on the right. We want to be known for demand generation, for content marketing, for B2B social media marketing, for employee advocacy and website UX. So everything that we write about is ultimately going to stem, and you'll see this as we get into topic ideation here in a minute, from those three to five content pillars. Anything you want to well, add I, to that, I, Ray? Yeah, I would just, just like to add um, to the audience. So these content pillars, these are five subjects that our team, we train on all the time. Um, you know, we take seminars, we read blogs, but this is something, you know, we talk about E, experience, expertise, authority, and trust. We're always trying to build internally our chops on all five of these subjects. Yeah, great point. Excellent, excellent point, Ray. And so, yeah, we have to have those content pillars because without them, when we move into this next slide, oh my gosh, the, the work you'll create for yourself if you don't really feel confident that you've got your three to five content pillars down because this slide is all about the different formats of content that we need to produce. And some of these terms are gonna be new to you, I'm guessing. Um, and then some of these terms are just kind of uh, uh, rehashes of things you might've heard of before. But I wanna start at the very bottom and that is foundational content. You know, one thing that we feel absolutely critical about or that is absolutely critical for your business now is that you have foundational content on your website. Now, foundational content is long form, think 3000 words or more content that lives on your website that is an in-depth deep dive on each of your content pillars. Now, what we found is that most B2B companies that have been doing content marketing for a while, they have content like this already, but most of it's locked up in what's what they call eBooks or guides. So maybe you've done a guide on demand generation if you're Vendi Digital, or maybe you've done an eBook on that. What we're proposing to you is that you need to unlock that content and not have it gated up as a PDF, but rather live as web pages on your website um, that are a deep dive exploration of each of those topics. So once you figure out what your three to five content pillars are, the next thing you need to do is actually go write foundational content on each of those topics. Now, I did provide a resource for you on the agenda. I can't remember what I called it, but it's like the second or uh, uh, second or third link there on the on the resource section at the bottom that is an outline of what a foundation. Uh, document should look like. So it's got all the different sections outlined for you. Um, we're doing that for our business this year. We have not done a deep dive uh, for all the content pillars that we have. We're in process and doing that, but that's really kind of step one. You've got to go and build foundational content. Now you can't move, you can move on to step two without having all of your step ones done. So one thought might be start with one content pillar, if you will, demand generation for us, and, and start working on that, but you can still build these other pieces along the way. So it's not a do one and then move to the next. So that's what foundational content is, long form web-based content that lives on your website. I'm gonna move up to the next bullet or the next level up, which no, is number two, periodical content. Now we call it periodical content because it's serialized. It comes out um, with some regularity, 
but this is really blog topics, okay? So writing blogs on your website, we call them periodical for those reasons because we want them to be reoccurring with some regularity. But this is where topics come from. So at the bottom, we've got foundation. Each one of your content pillars needs to be uh, an in-depth study of, the, of that as a foundation piece. The blogs become, or the periodical content really becomes all of those topics that circulate around that content pillar. And you should, you should publish those with some uh, regularity. And so those are typically, you know, one to 2000 words. Um, and, you know, I've got some information again on that same resource that I just talked about, gives you an outline of what a good blog or periodical piece of content would look like. Uh, but we've got to have those. So we've got to have a foundation piece. And then we have to have a periodic piece. And then from there, we move up to number three, which is resources. So for every piece of foundational content, you want to be thinking about it. One way I, I've, I've heard people talk about it, and I kind of like this, is a content upgrade, right? So what are some things, resources that really help our customer as it relates to the topic that they're reading about um, that we've produced? How can we help them do the work at hand? You know, these would be tools or, or resources or swipe files, things that just help them get some quick wins. And that you can make available because honestly, as we build this foundational content and we build our periodic content, we want to give our audience ways to generate quick wins. One of the quickest ways to really get into the mindset of our buyer is to actually give them some tools that will help them do their job, help them improve what they're trying to do today. So that's what we mean by resources. Um, and then moving up from there, number four, we've got distributed content. Now, the next slide is going to walk you through that in more detail, but this is the idea of atomizing everything that we've talked about and getting that information that's really in the three below. So foundation, periodic, and resources, and distributing that content out where our buyers go to learn. And then the top of the pyramid um, is employee-generated content and user-generated content. So how do we go from you know, building a base at the foundation to ultimately getting our employees and our customers uh, creating their own content that all ties to the story that we're trying to tell uh, to the audience, to the market. Uh, hey, Ray, Paul, anything I, you want to add to that? Yeah, Paul, I'd like to give you an opportunity for a quick win. Could you please explain to an old guy like me, what the heck is a swipe file? A swipe file. Great, great. Uh, thanks for asking that question. So a swipe file just simply means um, uh, things that that people can uh, download or look at, I'll give you a great example. And you'll see some of these next month, big time. Um, uh, with all this AI stuff going on in chat GBT, there's been a lot of swipe files that have been produced that are like prompts, like go to chat GBT and type this prompt in. I typed this prompt in and I got this result. So here's some slides, if you will, of prompts I've used on chat GBT that you can try on your own to be successful in your business. So you're swiping something that somebody else produced to help you do a job. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes, it does. Thank you. And very popular. Swipe files are great because people love them. You know, think about how hard chat GBT is right now. And if you have somebody kind of give you a starting point, it makes your job easier. And that's really what resources are all about. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So fasten your seatbelts. We just talked about all the different formats that we need to produce. Now we just wanted to create a picture that's a little busy, but hopefully enables you to see how all this stuff ties together. And so working over from the left side, um, we start with you know the research that we did and the audience selection that we came up with and that messaging playbook, which really helps us understand what our audience cares about. And that informs all the content that we need to produce and host on our website, which would include the things we just covered. You know, our foundation content, periodic content, our resources. The one thing that we didn't talk about are conversion pages, but we included that here because honestly, your conversion page is part of your story, right? Um, you know, Ray and I were joking about this the other day, how many times we, we go and look at a company's website and man, they've spent so much time and energy producing a beautiful looking website and making sure that they're the words are in the right places. And then you go to their primary conversion page on their website and it's terrible. It doesn't tell the story. It doesn't help the buyer kind of understand why I need to take the next step. There's too many form fields. There's too many required fields, all those things. And so ultimately your conversion page is part of your content strategy and part of your story. And so- And a, and a, ahead, contact, us, a contact us page with just- fields and without reinforcement of what they have just seen in their journey to get to that page is not a conversion page. 
So yeah. absolutely. Yeah. In fact, you know, we we tell our clients, your conversion page is just part of how you're solving the problem for them. And it's not, hey, I need you to fill this form out because I want to lead. It's like, hey, you came to my website, you have a problem. We can solve that problem for you. The first step in solving that problem for you is go here, fill this form out, and then we're going to help you solve your problem. That's Amen. that's when conversions work the best. And yeah. so that content lives on our website, okay? Then it gets atomized. Ray, explain to the to the folks what atomized means. Well, you take let's talk about that uh, long form piece of content that's on your website, um, and then let's talk about periodic content. So you've got your foundational, which is the long form, and then you can take um, subtopics from that foundational piece and break it down into blogs. From those blogs, you can then take salient points from there, ideally your H2s or your H3s, and all of a sudden that you pair that up with a, a compelling image um, that's related to the customer's problem, you pair that up and now you've got a social post. Um, you can take a YouTube video that you've done and break that into multiple pieces of social content. Um, you know, 90 to 120 second videos. You can even break those down even further into 17 to 25 second videos to get people to show, again, we're, we're talking about, you know, that we have empathy, we have experience, we have authority, we have trust. So it's breaking down something bigger, just like the word says, atomize, into something smaller that reinforces our eat. Great, Ray. And, you know, this, uh, we're, you're actually living a, a part of that for us, right? We're doing these demand gen jam sessions. We record them. Uh, they end up on our website as a uh, long piece of content, a foundational piece of content. They also get atomized. You'll see them show up on LinkedIn and other places um, as part of our content flywheel. And so, you know, the, the key is, yes, there's a lot of great content we need to produce, but by atomizing the content, we're doing two really good things for our business. One, we're making the workload less effort because we're just slicing up our good content. Two, we're being more productive because we're communicating key messages in the market around content pillars, which makes it easier for our customers to get exposed to the content. And then because they're always about three to five things, three to five macro topics, they're going to remember how we can help them. And that that's really what the key is. And then what happens over here on the right, um, where you see stage, you know, there's, there's a cold audience, somebody that, that doesn't know that you exist and we need to create content um, that's going to get their attention. And then we have warmer audiences uh, that we want to reach. And so when we atomize our content, we also want to break it up and think about the different stages that our buyers are in. And we're going to get more into that a little bit later on when we get into topics. But the higher up, we want to be focused more on uh, you know, promoting the category, if you will, the lower down, we want to be promoting how we can help you more. So at the top of the funnel for us, you might see us put a post out there about demand generation and why that's really important and how businesses need to think differently about B2B marketing as it relates to demand generation. That would be a top of the funnel piece. But as you move farther down, we might be talking about, hey, this is how we do it. If we were in your shoes with the problem that you have, here's how we would go about tackling that. In a way, think about this content that you're consuming today. That's what we're doing here, right? We're showing you how we would do content marketing. And so this is more of a mid-funnel type uh, piece of content, if you will. And I'm just kind of dropping that down to help you kind of see how all this ties together. Um, and we notice we've got two different types of retargeting. That's how on the paid side, we we reach our different audiences. So we would advertise our content at a cold level and then have two different types of retargeting to get the two different kinds of messages that we're wanting to get out based on, on user behavior, buyer behavior. And then ultimately, everybody comes to our website because our long form content lives there. And that information then funnels right back to the beginning and it creates a cycle so that we stay top of mind, which ties all the way back to our demand gen framework. You know, we want to nurture relationships and stay top of mind because we can't control when a buyer is going to be ready to buy, but we can control that they do think of us first. All right, let's move on. I know that was a, a lot to cover. Oops. That was a doozy. That was a doozy. In fact, you know, before I jump too far in, I'm going to just stand down. Andrea, do you, are there any questions that have come up as we've covered those uh, topics about, you know, um, identifying categories and, and the different formats? Yeah, one question, Paul, that we get is, um, does it only have to be, or can we have just only three to five content pillars? 
Oh yeah. That, that's a great question. Uh, Ray, you want me to tackle that or do you want to tackle that? No, you go for it. Okay. So, um, you know, three to five is a rule of thumb, right? In fact, honestly, we say three to five. I don't know that I've ever had a client only do three. I think coming up with three content pillars is probably really hard. Most people want to have like 20. So the idea is, you know, uh, keep it as, as few as possible and try to stay in that five bucket. If you have six, probably not the end of the world, right? Um, if you have seven, probably not the end of the world. If you have 10, I think that's probably too much because remember the, the battle is for the mind. We're trying to get inside the mind of our customer and we've got to create context. And if we talk about too many things, then they're not going to understand. We're going to confuse them. Anything you want to add to that, Ray? Well, also, you know, we've run into this before with one of our clients just recently and that they had so many things, their business, they have a lot of sub businesses, a lot of lines of business and the Google helpful content. They write about a lot of things and we've had to get them to focus on pillars going forward because um, Google deprecated their their rankings across the board because they just they don't have the. They couldn't prove to Google that they had the authority across all, all these different lines of business. So you want to focus in on your primary lines of business and that solve the problems that your customers need solving. Great, 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 uh, great question, Andrea, and great answer, Ray. Uh, any other questions, Andrea, before we move on? Uh, yeah, Michelle, you had a follow up question to that. You can go ahead and ask it if you'd like. Yeah, so if you have a if you have a, a customer or if you have a business that has distinct customer segments, so these customer segments have different problems to solve, right? So they're not similar. Um, should you concentrate and have different pillars of content then for the different segments? And then you know you might use the same platforms, but you would didn't have to. You'd have to then have that content be very specific or try to be very specific to that particular segment, right? Yeah. So I would, you know, one of those things you want to tackle in a case by case basis, I'm trying to think of a scenario, but oftentimes, for example, we have um, clients that have like a channel. And so they might think about their channel as a segment. And then they have like end user customers, like they, maybe they sell to a, particular industry or type of customer, but they actually sell through a channel. And so they're trying to, you know, write to that channel because they want to create interest and awareness with the channel, but they also want to write. Um, and so that might be, Hey, let us help you make more money. Let us help you, you know, expand your portfolio of things to talk about your customers. And so those are like different things that you wouldn't necessarily talk to an end user customer about. And so that would be a scenario, Michelle, where I would think maybe you have two distinct content strategies, one for your end user customer, and then one for your channel, because what, again, it goes back to filing away yeah. in their brain. What are we trying to file away for this channel? We want to file away. We can help you grow your business for this end user customer. It's whatever problem my solution solves. So that would, I think, predicate having two totally different content strategies. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great question, by the way. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Excellent. Andrea, any other ones? Nope. I think we're good to continue. Okay. Well, let's move on because I know we've got a lot uh, more to go here. So, um, all right. So once we have our, our content pillars, we also need to think about categories in our website because we need to organize our website in a way that uh, aligns all of the content on our site, especially that periodical content, your blog content um, within these content pillars. Now that becomes really hard um, because not always does everything that you need to talk about or the way that you need to categorize your site align perfectly with the pillars. And so what we recommend to clients is start with your content pillars and then add your services uh, as well as the, to, to your category structure. So uh, you see that on the left. And, and last month I showed you this and I showed you ours, but really, so we have, I think we have 11 categories on our website, um, the five uh, pillars and then six services that we offer. And then our entire website is organized up under uh, those categories. And that's really, really critical for search engine optimization, especially since the Google helpful content update that happened in August. Um, they really want to know when they crawl your website that you are an expert in a handful of things, not generalists on everything. So when you organize your content around these categories, 
then they're going to go, oh, okay, this, this business really is about these things. Another thing that you want to do as an exercise, once you figure out what those categories are for your website, um, go look at your category structure, because if you're like us and like most B2B companies out there, your categories are all over the place. This is just a screenshot from one of our clients. You can see that they've got all kind of duplicate categories going on because there wasn't a lot of discipline and on getting that stuff organized, because quite frankly, up until the Google helpful content update, uh, it wasn't that important, but now it is really, really important. So we'll get to auditing here a little bit later on, but an audit will help you see how all of your content is organized under categories. And that's going to be really helpful to you. Um, another thing that we question we get asked all the time is what is the difference between a category on our website and a tag on our website? And a huge mistake that we see companies make is they treat them the same when they're really totally different. So a category is really, if you think about it like a book, a category is like the chapters of a book that you would find at the beginning of the book. And so these are all the different major categories, if you will, major sections of our book. We need to use them sparingly as a result of that, okay? So think of categories as used sparingly. Tags are like the index in the back of the book. And so, you know, think about your textbook in college. If you wanted to find all the places where demand generation was mentioned in the textbook, you would go to the index and it would tell you all those different places. That's what a tag is for. And so we can use those very liberally and they can really be driven by all the different key phrases that are important to our business. So use category sparingly and then use tags liberally. And I think you'll be in great shape. Also, another way to think about it is, you know, think of categories as like aisles in a grocery store. Like what, where's the, you know, the, the, the card section of the grocery store versus the milk section of the grocery store. Those are different sections and they would be categorized differently. Uh, so hopefully that helps. And they're both really critical for SEO today. Um, and then just to land the plane on all of this, we've been talking about, you know, coming up with these content pillars and really driving that so that we can identify categories in our website. And that now ultimately we can identify our hub and spoke strategy. This is going to help our users. And it's also going to help uh, our search engines quite a bit, because what we want to do is take that foundation content. You know, that's that new concept that we introduced a couple of slides ago, these long form pieces of content that more than likely were guides or eBooks in the past that are locked up as PDFs. We want to convert those to web pages and those become the hub of our hub and spoke. And then the periodic content that we produce that is more topic driven um, become the spoke pieces, if you will, of our hub and spoke strategy. And so all of those live within these categories. So as we have a category, there will be a foundation piece, right? That's tied to uh, one of our content pillars. Our blogs will be the periodic content that comes out uh, that's topic driven. Those things are going to be interlinked together, but then all of the blog posts that are inside that category will be interlinked together as well. And so that's what we mean by hub and spoke. And you've probably heard that term before. We didn't invent it, but man, I'm telling you in 2023, it's very important that you organize your website this way. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Ray? No, just that the arrows that we have there, you're interlinking everything yes. together. Yeah, everything gets interlinked together. So everything points back based on the category, based on the foundation piece. Um, and then the things that are within a category are also interlinked. I probably should have put a link back and forth like that. Great point, Ray. Thanks for making that, uh, calling that out. Um, another piece to this is we want to have category uh, hub pages or content hub pages. You probably heard that term before. And so if you're on a WordPress environment and you're using categories, WordPress is going to automatically create a category page for your website. That's awesome. Um, where basically every page, if you were to click on it, um, every, every blog that is under that category is going to list on that page. The problem is that they look like crap. I mean, honestly, they, they are uh, developed automatically by WordPress. And if they're not designed, they're going to look really bad. And so what we recommend that you do is you actually build a content hub page for each of your categories. And you can see this is an example over here on the right of one of our uh, category homepages. And you can see that we start with, it's aligned with one of our categories. It's got an SEO optimized title. Um, you can see that we've got a highlighted a resource there. And then at the bottom, number four, all of the blog articles or periodic content that's aligned with that category are going to show up there. So it becomes 
a separate homepage on our website for everything about that topic. Um, so it's great for users, but it's really great um, for the search engines. And then finally, as we just talking about organizing our website, the last piece, and Ray's mentioned EAT a couple of times, this is a big part of EAT, and that is having authorship. So your foundation pages and your periodic content need to have authorship. Most B2Bs that we see today, they don't have authorship on their website, but they've got like uh, the byline says admin or something like that. And so make sure that you've got a subject matter expert associated with all of your content over here on the left side, you can see this is USA today. And if, you know, I wanted to go see all of Tom Vandenbroek's uh, articles, I could just click on his byline. It would take me to all the articles that he's written for USA today. Your website needs to follow that same architecture. And just, you know, that's the E, the first E, experience and experience, expertise, authority, and trust. Yep. And uh, I'm going to, I just noticed it's uh, 1253 and I want to get through topics. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to move us on and Andrea, I'd love to make us available to answer questions, but I'm just going to encourage everyone. If you've got questions, let's take it to the community, the demand gen jammers group, and let's get those questions asked and answered there. Cause I want to make sure we get through topics before the top of the hour. So all of that was to kind of get us ready to move into the topic section. Cause now we have our content pillars. We know the types of content we want to produce. Now we need to ideate on actually, what are we going to write about? What are the top Topics that are going to matter to our customer. And we've got a little formula here that we wanted to show you today. So the first thing you want to do is just grab a content pillar, right? Because remember, we're going to always write inside of our content pillars, those three to five pillars. So we start there. And then the next thing we need to do is go to the funnel and stage. Remember, we talked about that. I've got a subsequent slide that will give us a little more depth here in a second. And we want to think about our audience. So our audience might be who within our ICP are we trying to write this piece of content for? So step one, let's start with a pillar. Step two, let's think about the stage of the funnel and let's think about the actual consumer of our content. And then step three, let's go and grab a part of our narrative or a part of our point of view or our unique selling proposition that we really want to um, communicate within this piece of content. And then finally, begin with the end in mind by thinking about what are the key takeaways? What are the learning objectives? And man, I can't tell you how critical that is. So in, instead of, you know, let's grab a key phrase analysis and let's do the key phrase alphabet and pick something that's got a lot of search volumes. Let's start with a pillar. Let's think about our customer. Let's think about our narrative as it relates to this topic. And then let's think about the key takeaways. What are they going to walk away knowing? How is their life going to be better? And by going through that process, you will come up with a ton of good ideas to write about. One of the challenges that I feel like companies have is they get too uh, tied down to the key phrase analysis. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, demand generation left-handed smoke shifter gets, and I just made that up, but gets a thousand searches a month. How in the world are we going to write a blog about that? Forget that stuff, right? Google's smart enough now to know if you're starting with the customer and you're delivering useful information, you're going to get rewarded with good search traffic. Anything you'd like to add to that, Ray? No, no, I, I want to, let's keep pressing on. Okay. Because all right. So this next slide here is really just thinking about the funnel and the stage. And so again, we've made these slides available for you, but we need to be addressing each of the stages um, when we're writing our content. And Ray, you touched on this slightly a few minutes ago, but you know, at the top of the funnel, we want to promote our category. About 40% of our content that you write needs to be um, about the category uh, or at that top of the funnel, if you will. Middle of the funnel is really about useful information. This is where our tools and resources and use cases can live. Um, that's about 40% of our content. And then about 20% of our content will be at the bottom where we're really talking about how we can specifically solve problems for you. And this is where testimonials and uh, success stories and things like that, um, outcomes, uh, research and outcomes, uh, that kind of data works really, really well at the bottom of the funnel. And that's about 20% of our content. Um, when we think about our audience, there's really three different types of users within our ideal customer profile, and we don't want to write for all of them in every single piece. Now, sometimes you can, you can create a piece of content, like a foundation piece of content that would address each of these different types of audience. 
but we also want to create content specifically for them. So again, I've got this here. We're not going to have time to go into deep, uh, a deep dive on it, but you've got your decision maker at the top. You've got the manager that's in charge of implementing it in the middle. And then you've got the end user at the bottom or the influencer. And so you want to make sure that you're kind of speaking to all of your different audience types so that um, we can't really control who's going to come over to your site, but you want to be able to have some information that would be useful uh, for these different types of users. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this, but it's in your slide. It's just the, the idea of no and do. Um, and so I'll just introduce the concept and then I'm going to have to move on. But when you take your content pillar, uh, which is the first step of coming up with topics, just ask yourself, what is it that you want the customer to know about this topic? And then what now that they know that, what do we want them to do next? So that's the idea of know and do. It's a great exercise to do as a team, and you'll come up with a lot of great topics when you do that. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this section by just talking through a couple of things on the content topic checklist. Uh, Ray, you talked about blanket advice. If you're trying to come up with good ideas, go look for something that's going on in the market that, that's an inch deep and nobody's going a mile deep. You know, like, for example, in our world, people talk about thought leadership. Oh, you got to be right in thought leadership. Thought leadership's critical, but nobody talks about what is thought leadership or how do you create it or what makes really good thought leadership. That would be an example of going a mile deep on topics that are blanket advice. Uh, so that's just an example. Some of our favorite sources for coming up with topics are talking to customers, groups and forums, uh, SEM Rush, Chat GBT. Come next month, we'll be talking about Chat GBT a lot. That entire session is dedicated to that. So we'll go into more detail about that. Um, okay, last topic, and I'm going to cover this in one minute because we're out of time. You've got to do an audit. An audit gives you the ability to look back and see what are your opportunities? What are things that need to be potentially removed from your website? What are things that need to be rewritten? What are things that can be atomized? All of that information is available when you do a good content audit. If you have questions on how to do that, let's definitely cover that in the Demand Gen Jammers group. We have a lot of ideas on how to do a good audit. Uh, we just audited our site, and you can see how lopsided um, we are when we look at our different categories. So over here on the far right, these are our different categories that we want to um, that we how we've got our website organized, and you can see we are super heavy on the B two B social side, right? 118 articles on our website, periodic pieces of content or content, um, and the next one down is digital strategy at 43. So just by doing that one little piece of an audit, audit, we can see that we've got a lot of other things we need to be writing about, and so I wish I could go into more detail about that. I just simply am out of time. Uh, but just a reminder, next month, AI and marketing, we're really going to break it down. Ray, you asked about swipe files. Man, we're going to bring a ton of them next month. And so if you're curious about how to get the most out of chat, GBT, how to leverage AI so it doesn't take your job, trust me, it's not going to take your job. But how do we turn it into a really awesome intern? How do we use it like a tool? Uh, that's what we're going to be covering next month. So again, sorry we don't have time to wrap for questions. I do want to be good stewards of everybody's time. Hopefully this was really helpful. Um, let us know in the comments and then please join us at our demand gen jammers group and let's keep the discussion going there until next month guys have a great one take care everybody thanks everybody, thanks, everybody. See ya. Thanks.